you have your book, I want to draw your attention to a page here that might be helpful as you do some exam prep. So if you've got your book, open that up. I've heard people talking about how do I keep track of all the formulas, which is a very honest question. Um, there's just, again, with statistics, there is so much different than some of the other classes you've taken. Um, one of them being, as we've done the last several chapters, I mean, there's a process that goes in. It's a, there's a very common way that we go about it, and we attack the problems in a very similar way. But we just end up using different tools. Um, so this is just a screenshot of it on the board here. Um, but if you go down to um, chapter 13, and then below chapter 13, there's all these appendices. Uh, so if you're looking for stuff like more example problems, they're down here. They have a sample final exam. Um, I honestly haven't looked at it yet, but if it's, it's statistics is statistics, they're probably similar to the questions I would create anyways. Um, but they also give then solutions to that. So you can go in there and look at it and start, you know, again, doing some more review in addition to the slides I sent out that we'll start covering next uh, Monday, Wednesday. And then there's the online uh, quiz that's set up for the final exam that has some example problems on there that that you'll want to do because that's actually points. Um, and I reopened the chapter four through eight, the exam prep that we did for, chap uh, for the second exam. So if you wanted to go in there and redo it, you can. Look at the problems again, you can. Um, if you did really well the first time, or since the exam ended, you can still go in, and even if you don't do as well, it'll still keep whatever your highest score was. Um, and if you didn't do well in prepping for the second exam, now's your chance you can actually boost that back up, and it will retroactively uh, increase your, chat, your exam two score. Um, so that's what's going on there. Um, let's see. So, yeah, so if you go here, then, like I said, this is just a screenshot. But if we look at the actual one here in class, um, so in preparation for the exam, right, I'll send out the websites you can have, the data sets you'll use. Um, you can have a single piece of paper front and back with anything else you want on it. Um, you'll have access to the book, so this information will all be there. So don't feel like you need to just copy it all down, right? Uh, and then, there's something else I was going to say. can't remember on that. So, uh, our exam then is the f first, no, yes, first day of exams on that Monday, 1030 to 1230 in this room. So, aside from softball, I think they're the only ones that are actually out of town. Everybody else will be here. So, wonderful. Yeah. Yay. So now, as we enter the very last topic, which is the second half of chapter 13, we did the last time we met, we talked about the F test and the F test being used for a one way ANOVA. And a one way ANOVA that we did for the last time we met was if I had multiple data sets, three or more data sets, and I wanted to compare the means. The other way you can use the F test is for comparing variances. Right. So if we want to check and see if I have two data sets, and it's only for two data sets, if I have two data sets, and I want to check and see if the variances are the same or different, I can use the F test. And you might be thinking a couple things. So one, recall, when I say variance, that's sigma squared. So if you're given a standard deviation, you have to remember to make sure to change it to sigma squared. And we're going to be checking to see if variances are not equal to more or less, just like we've done with other hypothesis testing. But why do we care about this? A lot of times, especially manufacturing processes, think about trying to put together two different uh, parts, if you will, to anything that's being machined. Um, anything from, on a, on a simple level, Right, if you have Tupperware, you got a little Tupperware dish. This is manufactured, and then the lid is manufactured some, in a different machine. You really hope that this diameter and that diameter are going to be, they'll vary by the same amount. Because if this has more variance, it's going to probably either be too tight or too loose too often. 
So not only do you want their means to be the same, you would also want their variances to be the same. All right? If the means are the same but the variances are different, you're going to have a lid that doesn't fit. I mean, that's on a real basic level. You talk about anything that's actually being, like again, manufactured, um, metal casting, anything along those lines, you're going to want there to be a low, low, low probability that the variances differ so that you know that your parts will all work together as you fit and make things happen. Um, there's many other aspects to it, uh, but from a, yeah, from a more like hands-on point of view, that's what that would be. So this is what we're going to do. So here's the equation in the upper left-hand corner. That's the F test for comparing two variances. And some of you might look at this and say, well, we, well, let's go like this. The null hypothesis, as has been true with all the other null hypotheses, is hypothesi, hypotheses, hypotheses that we have done, the null is that they're equal. There's no difference. When we talked about chi-squared, we said there's no association. We say they're independent. But in this case, for variances, we would say that the variance of the first data set is equal to the variance of the second data set. And variance is sigma squared, first data set, second. So if I do that, this value and this value are the same, which means my F can simplify to the standard deviation, sample standard deviation of my first data set, sorry, the sample variance of my first data set divided by the sample variance of my second data set. Because up here, sigma 2 squared and sigma 1, if sigma 1 squared and sigma 2 squared are the same, they reduce. Or when you divide by fractions and multiply by the reciprocal, however you get there, you'd find out that those are the same values. All right, so it ends up being actually a fairly quick computation. The F function, what we talked about last time when we did the F as a one-way ANOVA test, we did F, I'll do it here in yellow, we had F and we had the first number was K minus 1, which is the number of uh, data sets that I have. So if I had four data sets, it would be 4 minus 1. All right. If I had five data sets, I was comparing five means, it would be five minus one. And then the second one was n minus k. And n that we did with the sorority question was the total number of women surveyed. There were 20. And we compared four different sororities. So this was four minus one, it's three. This was 20 minus four, which was 16. For doing variances, it's just going back to the two data sets. The first data set minus one for however many were in that data set, second data set, and two minus one. All right. The F test has two different degrees of freedom, if you will. So when they combine together, this is what we have to remember in order to use the applets that we're going to use. So um, unfortunately, stat blue does not have the F test for variances. It has the F test when we're doing a one-way ANOVA, which we used the last time we gathered, but we don't have it for this type of, uh, this test that uses the F test. Hypothesis test that uses the F test, all right? Um, so we're gonna walk through how to do it. So we start with this. Take a read while you do that. I so first off, what are the hypotheses going to be? Null alternative. Sigma 1 squared equals sigma 2 squared. What's my alternative hypothesis going to be? Sigma 1 squared is less than sigma 2 squared because test the claim that the first instructor's variance is smaller so it's going to be a less than my formula will be f equals s1 squared over s2 squared which in this case would be 52.3 over 89.9 i'll go back up to the conditions all we're going to have for conditions on this one is comparing 
variances. We don't have, or I should say, we have not in this class discussed any other way of comparing variances. So this is the only scenario where if we're talking about comparing variances, it's like, well, then we're using the F test. That's it. There's no other condition that we're going to look at. Theoretically, there is. We would say that we would hope that variances themselves are normally distributed. That's harder to show. Um, you can go through some manipulation with looking at the raw data set to see if we could likely expect variances to be normally distributed. We're just not going to. More about just using the tool and then communicating out what the results are. All right. Uh, and we'll do this. My degrees of freedom. So my F distribution will be... Well, they each had 30 exams, so it'll be 30 minus 1 and 30 minus 1. Since they're the same, I put both the numbers in there. And then lastly, what is this number? Did anybody find 52.3 divided by 89.9? 0.58, give me another couple. One eight. Before I go to the next slide, I'll say one thing, and that is that if we assume they're equal, and if they end up being close to equal, then this ratio will be close to the number one. Because if they're the same, something divided by itself is one. So the further away we are from one, either below it or above it, the more likely it is that we'll reject the null. Other things to point out, sigma squared, s squared, this can never be negative, this can never be negative, which means you'll always have a positive f value. And the lowest f value you can have is zero. Much like a chi squared, the lowest you can have is zero. You can't actually get zero, because if my standard deviation was zero, well, I guess you could. Your standard deviation is zero if all of the data points are exactly the same if everybody scored on some test in 85 everybody did the standard deviation is zero because the average distance of every data point from the mean that's your definition of standard deviation well if they're all the same number then they're all the same distance from the mean which is that same number so there is no distance and you'd have a mean of zero unlikely to happen anyways set it up in our question over here if i said this one is less than that one then the n for this one is the first one. The n for that one is the second one. Whichever one's in the numerator is the first one. The denominator is the second one. So now go to the applets page. Pull that up. I hope you have had that bookmarked and been using it a bunch. But go to the applets page and find the f test, which is simply called f.html. Just like the t test was t.html, the f distribution is f. HTML. And when you plug in the two degrees of freedom, the first one is the first number, second one is the second number. And how do you know which is the first and second? It depends on how we. So if you set it up as two, 29 and 29, and then what do we say it was? The x value there is point five eight. 818 and which direction do we have to go what was our alternative hypothesis our alternative hypothesis was less than so you got to make sure that the drop down menu is probability that x is less than x and then it will shade well, something a little higher 0.5 is there so that's about 0.58 It'll shade that area right there. And that area is 0 0.07532. So again, if you're just watching the slides, you're missing out on an opportunity to be practicing how to get to these values because you need to know how to do it on the exams. So you grab that number from the, stat, uh, from the applets 
And then, as we've done in all the process, right? We did conditions, hypotheses I wrote down, the formula I wrote down. I have a picture that I've drawn that I basically copied off of the applets page. I've got my point marked in there. I've got it shaded the correct way, consistent with the alternative hypothesis. And then I make a decision. I do not reject the null. If we assume the variances between the two instructors are the same, having a difference between them this big could only happen 7.53% of the time. This is not enough evidence to reject the null. Do not reject the null. There is insufficient evidence to prove that the instructor's variances differ. The difference we saw just due to chance. All right, so moving on. What about the male and female heights from this class? Now, obviously, everybody's not in here, but think about the people that are in here. Do you think there is greater variability amongst the males or amongst the females that are members of this class? What do you think? Do you need to make everybody stand up? Probably not. So we'll go like this. The variance of the females compared to the variance of the males, the null is always that they're true. Do you think one is more than the other? Which one do you think has a higher variance? Yeah, it's a good guess. All right. And as I was thinking through this and I thought about everybody as they walk in the room, I was like, oh, yeah, I think there's a lot more variability in male height than female height. All right. So we're going to test to see if this is true. Is there any real importance to if they do vary? There isn't. But this gets you to connect with like seeing around the room and going, yeah, I can probably see female. Yeah. Um, so I took a little screenshot just on the left there of a portion of the data. We have fewer females in the class, so this is all the female heights that when they filled it out were. Now, again, this was technically our class and the other class that filled out the survey at the beginning of the semester. But these were the heights of the females. So there's just a screenshot of that. What are my conditions? I am comparing variances. Therefore, use the... F distribution, the F procedure, the F test, something along those lines. So that's what you would write for conditions. My hypotheses I wrote on the previous page, so I'm not going to write them again. The formula, F, and I'll tell you these numbers in a minute because I can't remember what they are. Uh, I think, yeah, we'll figure it out. So I think it's on my next slide. Um, but it will equal... The sample standard deviation of, which one did I list first? Divided by S squared sub males. Because my alternative hypothesis was that sigma squared sub F is less than sigma squared sub M. So the first one you list is the numerator value. The second one you list is the denominator value. I don't have a graphing calculator and things like that, and you wouldn't have one for the exam. I'm not expecting you to, but if you needed to find the standard deviations for more than one data set, you can, in stat blue, on the left-hand side, you'll see one called multi-sample descriptive statistics. So you can put in more than one data set. So I did the males here, I did the females there. So here I had the males as one and the females have two. So we just got to be careful which ones are which. It's going to make some graphs. We don't really need them, but I just put in a bin width so that I, it would actually let me do the next step. The next step was this. It actually makes a plot. And you can go, oh, look at that. Here's the males. There's the females. Do you think this is going to support 
my conclusion at the end that males have a stronger variance than the females? Yeah, I think so. Because you can see that the male height has a much bigger range from what, about 80 down to 60. So their range is 20. The females is 12. The male's IQR is also greater than the females. So all in all, it looks like the males will be greater. I don't need to do this for the F test. But again, it adds to that level of what are we trying to understand? What are we comparing as we're going through this? It gives you two box plots. The males were in blue. The females were in red. It looks like the males have a longer spread anyways. And here's the females. But this is the numbers I need to remember. Here's what I have to have. And when I did this, I put the males in the numerator. So we're going to have to do it the other way around. We're going to have to flip-flop this. So our F that we said was going to be S squared sub female divided by S squared sub male. So it'll equal those two numbers flip-flop, 3.0786 squared. And then because I switched these, these two need to switch. It'll be F 18 comma 50, oh, sorry, 17 comma 52. There were, in this sample, 53 males, so that's why it's 52 down here. In the females, there were 18, and that's why down here it's 17. I'm only caring about the variances. I'm not caring about the means. I'm not caring about their five number summary. Minimum Q1, median Q3, max, that was the males. Minimum Q1, median Q3, max, that was the... Uh, females, all we were looking for is the standard deviation. So if I do that, the number I did, so I did it the other way around. So if we flipped this, I could take one over that number, and what will that be? Did anybody calculate that number out? Zero point six two zero nine three. Okay. Go to your applet. You're going to have to, in yours, switch those to be 17, then 52, because we did females over males. 17 was females, 52 was the males as the n minus 1, n minus 1. So do that. Take this number, put it in for x, and then I will come back to a second. I'm going to give you a second to do that right now. Mm -hmm. So after you get those numbers figured out that you've tried, I'll flip to the next screen. Variances were different. Here and here. That squared over that squared. But when you get to 52, that was enough. Sample size was larger to detect smaller differences. Back when we did uh, um, confidence intervals to estimate a population proportion, there was a question on the second exam that asked, what's the minimum sample size required to get a margin of error of 0.03? And then you could have worked through that. There's actually a stat blue button that has a minimum sample size requirement. You just put things in there where you put in, I want this to be my margin of error. If I know P and Q, I put those in. If I don't, I put 0.5 and 0.5. And then it will calculate out the minimum sample size necessary to have that restriction. If I want to have a smaller margin of error, the sample size is going to go way up. Because if I want to be more confident, smaller margin of error, I need to sample more. But same thing too, and then on a hypothesis test, if I want to detect a difference, and I'm not picking it up with 17, sampling more, if it's a small difference, we'll pick it up. Now again, if you look at my screen, when I did this in prep for today's, I listed the males first and the females second, so I had the males variance over the females variance, and it gave me 
an X score of one point, or an F test score, an F score of 1.6105. When we did it here in class, we did it the other way, and so we had a number that was down here, 0.6 something, is whatever it was. So you put that number in, but this will be the same. So whether you did it as males first and then females versus in class we did it females then males, as long as you keep these numbers consistent for the degrees of freedom for the males and females, the way it's listed left to right, the 1.6105 probability or the area above it, 0.14, the 0.6 that we did here in class gave the same area, 0.14023. Which means what? I won't reject the null. And then I would say something for an interpretation along the lines of there's a 14% chance of getting variances as different as we got between the males and females heights, which is not unusual. Therefore, there is not enough evidence to show that the variance of heights of females is <coughs> less than the variance of the heights of the males. So, and then that would be my, that would be my interpretation statement which if you didn't get that, you can always go back and re-listen -re -re to the video of it about how to write that down. For all the hypothesis tests we've been doing, there is a similar way that we phrase that. And that is common, and it's, it's basically a recipe. You do it this way. That's the consistent way of saying it, bringing in the interpretation of the context of the question along with what the F test results meant, and then the probability of it happening. So even though we can look around the room and say, but it sure looks like there's a lot more variability in the men, and the box plots furthered my belief that there was more variability in the men, when I tested it all out, I found out that there, there wasn't enough. So the difference we saw was not a big enough difference. So are they different? Absolutely. Is the male's variance higher than the female's? Yes. Is it significantly higher? Is it statistically significantly higher? The answer is no. One of the biggest reasons for that is there weren't that many women. If you still have the applet open, what happens if they're both 17 or if they're both 52? How does that change the results? So we got the applet open. I don't have it open. What if they're both 17? And then what if they're both 52 for degrees of freedom? But leave all everything else the same. What would that have meant if they had the same number in their sample? What's the p-value here when they're both 17? Change the degrees of freedom in both. So what if there were 18 men, 18 women? So we had 17 and 17. What would the p-value have been? You're checking it in the applet? Everybody's got their laptops open. I'm assuming you're all doing that. Point. If they're both 17, what, was, what would the p-value be? 0 0.167. So it would be higher. What if they're both 52? 0 0.04, okay? So 0 0.04, now we become significant. So what's happening? The more you sample, the, the easier it is to identify small differences. If I have a small sample, the difference between 3.9 and 3.0 or whatever the two variances were or standard deviations were is small 
And in order to detect a small difference, I need to have larger samples. And the reason why is if you sample more and we still see a small difference, we're verifying that there is a difference. So while 17 and 17 wasn't enough to say that, that the two